European rabbit, wild rabbit, we have in this country. To many, they always label the rabbit humble, but for me, it's far from humble. To me, the rabbit is an iconic creature that deserves the respect that it gets from us that have spent our life not only curtailing its advancement across the countryside and using it as a form of game to feed people, but also as the greatest conservation tool that escaped our landscape. To dot the eye on Iconic, it has been portrayed by playwrights, artists. We've got paintings, we've had films, you know, we've got monuments, we've got folklore all about the wild rabbit. The wild rabbit's journey to this country it started nearly 4,000 years ago in Iberia. Now, I'm not good with my history, but that is roughly where Portugal and Spain meet. And it was at the time when you had the Phoenician merchants. They were the greatest traders of that time. And they transported the rabbit as a trading commodity, not just around countries, but continents. And this is how the rabbit found its way over to the British Isles. A lot of people thought it was the Normans that brought them over, but it was in fact the Romans. The Romans cottoned on very early that cuny culture was the way forward. Now cuny culture was a way of farming rabbits, enclosing them in enclosed areas such as warrens or courtyards and breeding them not just for fur, for clothing, but for meat for the troops. Because rabbit, as we all know, is high in protein and low in fat and it was very relatively easy to keep on the hoof. And as the Roman Empire gathered momentum and it spread across the Europe and the world, it needed something to feed the troops. For the first 400 or so years, the rabbit struggled in our country, and that was because it was a relatively fragile creature. And our weather climates weren't really conducive, as well as the landscape, to have the rabbit doing what the rabbit does today. And we always think of today as the norm, but the rabbit, like ourselves, have evolved. And in the first 400, 500 years, there was a lot of forestry in our country. And when any woodland was cleared, the rabbits, the rabbits profited from the broken ground and moved in. The rabbit population remained fairly stable until something happened in the 19th century, and then it exploded. At this point in our history, Portion wasn't just about hunger, it was fueled by the hatred and anger that was growing in the way which people were being treated, causing severe social unrest. With so much damage and poaching reported to the government and the growing concern over the economic downturn, and with a possible revolution brewing, the government was placed under incredible pressure to bring in new laws to counteract this growing trend. One such law was the Black Act. An Act of Parliament passed in 1723 as a response to a series of raids by groups of poachers such as the Blacks. Arising in the aftermath of the South Sea bubble's collapse and the ensuing economic downturn, the people known as the Blacks gained their name from their habit of blacking their faces while undertaking poaching raids. They quickly demonstrated both a calculated programme of action and a conscious social resentment. Their activities led to the death of a gamekeeper's son, and to many at the time, this was seen as the final straw. The introduction of the Black Act was made to Parliament on the 26th of April 1723, and it came into force on the 27th of May. This Act introduced the death penalty for over 50 criminal offences, including being found in a forest while disguised, and no other single law passed during the 18th century equaled the Black Act in severity, as none appointed the punishment of death to so many cases. This social unrest, hardship and civil disorder had over the years inspired some of our greatest works of literature and art, although not many really portrayed the real hardships as it wasn't financially rewarding. The establishment wanted our history to be remembered how they remember our history, not sometimes as it really happened. One such painting in 1792 by George Morland was called Ferritin, a painting conjured during the Black Axe reign of terror and at the time, those caught in the act of ferreting or poaching and found guilty either went to the gallows or ended up being deported to Australia or Tasmania. The land that they poached belonged to the establishment made up of the landowners, the judges and the lawyers whom had a vented sporting or financial interest in the land. These times were extremely hard. And we've got to remember, the population of England at that time was only estimated around 12 million. Five million of those were living in the countryside. 
and that roughly estimates to one million families and were all occupied within agriculture, which was by far the biggest occupation. Yet 80% were landless and those that did have parcels of land couldn't or couldn't afford to employ any labour. Times were hard and these people had to supplement their income and this is where honest working men, women and children were forced to cross the line of decency and become hardened criminals. It was either that or let their families suffer. The severity of the punishment was very harsh but the world was a different place back then, a very hard and unforgiving one and we could never possibly relate to this nowadays. The most potent word of the era was game and even owning an engine for taking games such as a lurcher or a net or a stick was a punishable offence. Acts such as the Night Poaching Act introduced transportation for seven years just for being armed with a dog, a stick, a net or a ferret with the intention or the intention to take game or rabbits. The severity of the punishment had little to do with the fact that they were game or rabbits, it was a social statement of intent. Words cannot describe the ill blood created by these laws. Such examples of the punishment for stealing rabbits were plain to see. In 1813, two men took a rabbit from a trap. One got 18 months in prison, the other was transported for seven years. Eight years earlier, a man was publicly whipped in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk and sentenced to six months solitary confinement and hard labour for stealing a trap with two rabbits from Wangford Warren. Countless men were killed in battles between keepers, watchers and poachers, as well as the gallows and hard journeys when transported, all rabbit related crimes. But following a crime law reform campaign in the early 19th century, it was largely repealed in July 1823, when a reform bill introduced by a certain Robert Peel came into force. The Game Licence Act was simply seen at that time as another way to punish the workers for taking game and rabbits. Everybody required a licence so the officials knew where they lived and that there was no game taken on a Sunday, which was incidentally the only day they had off. In 1880 the Ground Game Act came into force, the result of the amount of complaints regarding the intolerable amount of damage done by the rabbit. This act undermined the previous elitist hold on taking game and rabbits and made it possible for any tenant to hunt rabbit legally, whereas previously it was only the rich and noble that could legally hunt rabbits without fear of persecution or prosecution. To me, the biggest change in the history of rabbit in our country happened in 1845 when the Enclosure Act was passed. The Enclosure Act allowed parcels of land to be split up and it coincided with another part of our history which was the advancement of the sport and gun and sport in the states and shooting in general and if you can imagine uh, parcels of land being split up a forestry was turned over to crops and hedges were, were planted you've got a load of new land with hedgerows which was ideal um, terrain for the rabbit to start to build more warrens and breed and the reason they were allowed to breed unhindered almost was because the advancement of the sport and gun and the popularity of a sport in the state meant there was more management for game birds and if the predators for game birds were being managed they were also the predators for rabbits so the rabbit was almost given a free reign to go and make new homes new territories and breed without predation now the rabbit's defense mechanism generally is its ability to breed and breed like rabbits um, that's because 90% of juvenile rabbits, they die before they're 12 weeks of age because they're obviously a prey species. And if you didn't know what a prey species is, it's an animal that has been designed to be lower down the food chain for the predators. So if for any reason that statistic has changed and only 10% died, then we're gonna see what we saw back then, a massive boom in the rabbit population. And this is where the agricultural uh, history started to evolve as well. Cereals were being sown and yields were being bigger. They had better ways of harvesting, but also there was larger fields full of crops. And this again was more food for rabbits. And not only were the rabbits causing damage on that side, but at that time people were starting to farm rabbits for the fur and for the food. And in East Anglia, especially the bricks, this is where the Warrens were.
And the reason they chose the Brex to put the Warrens in and to be patrolled by the Warreners is because the terrain and the climate was very Mediterranean. It was very sandy, rocky, flinty soil, which wasn't conducive to any good crop or even livestock come to think of it. So they were turned over to large Warrens. And, and in the heyday there, there was up to 50 Warrens in East Anglia and there was tens and twenties of thousands of rabbits annually being harvested during the killing time, which was September till February, and sent to the fur factories like what they had in Brandon. Um, rabbit felt fur was very popular at the time, and what would happen is these factories would divide everything. The fur, because they were in pristine condition, would go for the coats, the hats, the jackets. They would mulch up the, the ears and the claws, and they would be sent down to Kent to use as mulch for the hops. And the meat was all crated up and sent onto the trains to all the famous markets, such as Smithfield and so on around the country. And that was fairly stable. And, and in the wild, the rabbits were getting um, a stronghold in the damage, but the damage was getting too much. So there were several new laws brought in to try and counteract the amount of damage that the rabbit was doing and the millions of pounds that it was costing the government at the time. By the turn of the 20th century, up to 100 million rabbits were being caught annually. The government of the day was so concerned by the large numbers that they drafted an extra laws designated the whole of England and Wales a rabbit clearance area, giving all landowners an obligation to control rabbits on their land. The Prevention of Damage by Rabbits Act 1939 was closely followed by the Agricultural Act 1947 and the Prevention of Damage by Pest Act 1947. During the two world wars, the British and American governments encouraged people to keep rabbits as a source of homegrown meat and fur, and the practice of harvesting rabbits from the wild was very popular. People from villages would field an entire community with nothing more than some ferrets, some nets, and a good steely fit lurcher or two. After the war, these practices, these pursuits, these country pastimes were becoming very popular. And at that time, we were looking at a part in our history where a lot of the gamekeepers went to war to protect our country. And a lot of them, unfortunately, never came back, but their sons and their grandsons carried on their traditions. Even today, we find people working the land that there's granddads, grandsons, granddaughters, grandmothers, all closely connected with either the gamekeeping profession or pest control, mole men, rabbit men. And after the war, our, our world, our reliance on natural organic materials started to wane because we started to understand about synthetic materials, especially when it comes to harvesting rabbits where a lot of the nets were used were from an organic material such as hemp, whereas nylon started to come across the waters and people were starting to see the advantages of having a rock-proof man-made twine for using it, such as nets like the fishermen had been doing for years. So even back then, a lot of people, when it comes to rabbits, were thinking outside of the box. And even though there was a lot of rabbits around at that time, and the estimation of the population was roughly 60 million, now in the summer, the high summer, July, August, that would double to 120, 150 million rabbits. And it must have been an incredible sight to see because if you can think about the world would have been not as populated as it is now, it would have been a lot quieter, the ambient sounds would have been a lot greater, nature reacted differently, and you would have seen rabbits lifting from every crevice of the countryside. But just as they reached a peak of that population, we had a disease hit our country that would change the perception and habitat and lives of a lot of people forever. And that was, of course, myxomatosis. Myxomatosis, in my opinion, is the first and the biggest reason why man shouldn't try to biologically control nature in an unnatural way. Because myxomatosis, believe it or not, is a completely natural disease. When the people going out to the South Americas discovered all their rabbits on the ships were dying. They wondered what was going wrong. And then when they went on to the land, all their rabbits in the South Americas, and especially Uruguay, they were as fit as a butcher's dog. And that's because 
they were used to it, they were immune to myxomatosis carried on the mites and the fleas, but the European rabbits weren't. And back then, some people thought that this was a great way of controlling rabbits, so they transported some of these infected rabbits and fleas, and this is where Australia comes into play, because Australia really had billions of rabbits without knowing how many, in fact, and, and that all originated from some being taken over by, by a, um, an, a, a society of people that lived in Australia that wanted a little bit of Britain in Australia. So they took some rabbits over and they said, well, they're not going to do much harm. And these rabbits, because they had no predators, are now folklore in Australia, which is a completely separate topic. But they needed to be controlled. And they thought myxomatosis was the way of doing it. So that's where myxomatosis started on the, on the rabbits. But in France, nearer to home, there was um, a sport and tenant on a little estate in northern France. And he heard of this. So he sent some of his manservants to get some infected rabbits and put on his estate in France in 1952. Thinking that they would only curtail the advancement of the rabbits on his estate. Whereas it was his estate, the next estate, northern France, and it went all the way down to the coast. And this is where it transferred over to England. Now, what happened was, and, and research has proven this fact, is the infected rabbits come down to the bottom end coast of France and the thermals sucked them up into the air and carried them across. And it was only when the cooler air of Kent dropped them did the rabbits start to be affected in Kent. And in 1953 was when myxomatosis was first seen in England. Now, at the time, it was trying to be kept quiet by government organisations and organisations which are now uh, prevalent in looking after animal welfare. But the agricultural side of, of society, the farmers and the landowners, they heard about this and were driving from top end to the bottom end of the country to pick infected rabbits up to artificially spread this disease around because they wanted somewhere of protecting their crops. So when myxomatosis come over, there was a 98% a drop in population. So it went from 60 million down to how many hundred thousand it would have been. And not only did it have an instant effect on the agricultural scene because the yields were up and there wasn't much crop protection or uh, damage. Not only did it have an effect on the agricultural side of our history, whereas the yields went up and there wasn't as much damage, we also saw the first glimpse of why the rabbit is seen as one of the greatest conservation tools that we've got. Because of its close crop grazing, it grazes closer to the ground. And when all these rabbits died, then you had a different landscape. You had grasses that weren't kept back, so the stronger, bigger, more light, intensive, um, bigger grasses were overcrowding other plants. And the landscape changed as well. And for many years, all the animals and the skills and the knowledge of all the people that were controlling rabbits and harvesting rabbits they were gone. The rabbit clearance societies, the people who, who had learned how to, to use ferrets, how to use dogs, how to understand about rabbits themselves. That was all disappearing. And as a ferreter, this was one of the problems with the modern day ferret because overnight, not only did the rabbits go, but there was no need to keep ferrets. So unless you kept them as pets, a lot of ferrets were simply just put down. And it took many years before the rabbit population started to recover. Obviously, less rabbits, they're a lot easier to control because you don't have to manage large numbers. It's a percentage. So it wasn't until the late 60s, early 70s, till a rabbit started to get a stronghold in the country again. And that coincided with the popularity of using lamps at night to control pests such as foxes. So therefore, again, the rabbit's predators were being controlled to help certain aspects of land management and the rabbit had a boost. So once the rabbit started to boost again, 
the methods of harvesting them and the field sports and country pursuits, they started to become popular as well. So ferreting come back in vogue, lurchers come back in vogue, netting, shooting, and the rifles were getting better, the advancements in telescopic scopes were getting better. They were learning to use lamps with filters at night, which means people could go out and it was getting better in itself. And in the middle of the 80s, the rabbit was coming back to an estimated population of about 45 to 50 million, which was nearly as high as it was in its heyday, but there was more roads and, and urban areas and industrial sites, so that amplified the rabbit damage into little corridors. So although there wasn't as many rabbits, the damage was at that time estimated around the 150 million pound mark, which is a lot of money when you're talking a few decades ago. Unfortunately, myxomatosis was always had a bubbling undercurrent across the countryside. And every seven or eight years, you'd have a bad case and that would hit affect areas, but they would always bounce back. Unfortunately, in the 90s, we started to see another disease in the country. And at the time, it was a notifiable disease. This was viral hemorrhagic disease or rabbit hemorrhagic disease. Another disease that has been manipulated by man to control rabbits. Slowly by slowly, people from around the country started to notice a gradual reduction in rabbit numbers. Now, what we've got to remember is it's the late 90s. The internet had started and ways of communication was greater. So people would know quicker what's happening around the country. Again, it was, it was Australia and New Zealand which then brought to us RHD, RHD2 because the first one wasn't good enough. And that had a major effect on this country. And not content with that, and myxomatosis, and the advancement of technology, we've now, in 2019, had RHDK5, the fifth version, tested in New Zealand, uh, born from Korea, where they've got no wild rabbits, uh, uh, manipulated and that is having a greater effect on our rabbit population, coupled with the invention of thermal imagery, night vision, drop boxes, rabbit fence, millions of people, the change of mindset as well when you're managing rabbits. Uh, and I'm to blame, writing about ferritin in the summer, uh, putting drop boxes, understanding where rabbits move, using traps, shooting 12 months of the year, because it's not on the close season, and that's having an effect. And then you couple that with, like I said, construction, roads, and then you've got this disease. Problem is, the rabbit couldn't outbreed this disease. And it's had a dramatic and catastrophic effect on the rabbit population of the United Kingdom. So here we are in 2020, and the powers to be estimate we still have a population of 40 million rabbits whereas i personally would think it could be as low as 5 million rabbits because there's only a few strongholds of rabbits in the country and those strongholds got me thinking about my little theory i had about why they are strongholds uh, basically the, the belts of hills in north and england Northumberland, bits of Scotland, maybe a little bit of East Anglia and a little bit down uh, Sussex and Dorset way. And that's all down to stress uh, because the real high numbers in the dales and on the moors and stuff, there's very little predation to the rabbit, very little predation because the land is correctly managed. Whereas everywhere else in the country, everything is after the rabbit, buzzards, the, the red kites, um, foxes, badgers, polecats, mink, otters, weasels, stoats, even Mother Nature, because Mother Nature can be a cruel thing. And when the rabbits are, have their young, if it's cold and it's wet, that's going to kill the youngsters as well. So Mother Nature, not kind, not cruel, just this indifferent thing we all live by. It is accounting for a lot more rabbits than people realise. And I think because the rabbits in these areas that still have a lot of rabbits, aren't put under the stress all the other rabbits are. Their bodies seem to be stronger in shaking off diseases because those diseases have hit these areas. 
myxomatosis hits it every year. They bounce off from it. RHD, VHD has been there. I've, I've found carcasses myself six months later like it was never there because they've got these reservoirs and they seem to have this resilience from a body that isn't put under the stress. Now, nobody's ever gonna know if it's just a theory, if it's just pure luck or whatever, but it just, I don't, I'm not, when nature is concerned, I'm not a believer in a coincidence. And it just seems to be the less stress they have, the more resilient they are to diseases. And whereas today, presently, these rabbits, the lack of rabbits, are having a massive effect on the ecosystem, the pyramid, the food chain, because all these animals now that have historically predated on the rabbit for food have now got to turn their attentions to other sources of food. But because the rabbit is such a conservation tool, it is the landscape what is changing. It's the landscape what's suffering. All the lichens, the mosses, the butterflies, the, the rare flowers, the stone curlews, the skylarks, even the grey partridges in East Anglia, all animals that needed this close crop grazing and Again, I don't know if it's true, but all my findings and research and talkings I've been doing to people on the Brex in East Anglia, they tell me on these large estates, as soon as the rabbit went, the grey partridge went with them. Could be coincidence, but it, it just seems to be the rabbit's loss is, is related to a lot of struggles amongst the plant invertebrate and invertebrate world. And a lot of people don't see the rabbit as this conservation tool to an extent that now we're probably not far of reintroducing rabbits in penned off areas so they can sculpture the landscape so these plants and mosses and, and so on and you know invertebrates and vertebrates don't die off because nothing can be brought in to graze like a rabbit can because of it's the way its teeth go and it's close crop grazing right down to the ground and it's alkaline urine it sculptures a landscape. So the wild rabbit, it is an iconic creature. It is held aloft like the mythical hare or the magical red stag. But to those that live and understand the countryside, even myself as a, a, a rabbit controller and somebody who, who educates and promotes rabbiting and, and rabbit as game, it'd be very sad the day we don't have those bunchy bunnies running around frolicking and seeing the little white scuts going off because it's a part of the countryside. And this is what we've all got to understand about all our animals and all our passions. It's all got its place. And we're just here as guardians, custodians, as managers. We're not here to wipe stuff out. We're here to manage it. And the rabbit, it needs to be managed, but at some point in its history, it will need to be protected. And who better to protect them than those of us that know how to manage them and keep them safe. Just like the Warreners did in the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s. Joining the National Gamekeepers organisation is a choice for all shooters and gamekeepers. Help promote protect gamekeeping, conservation and shooting as we know it today. Get on the front foot. Support an organisation that will defend what you love and we do. NGO membership comes with £10 million of third party liability, a dedicated firearms licensing team, legal support as well as many, many other members' benefits. Be part of Britain's biggest conservation movement.